All right, welcome to your first lesson in geometry this year. We'll be covering two topics, 1.1 and 1.3. 1.1 is about line segments and angles, and 1.3 is kind of an algebra one review where we're gonna look at the distance formula and the midpoint of a line segment. So by the end of today, you should be able to answer how are the properties of segments and angles used to determine their measures, and how are the midpoint and length of a segment on the coordinate plane determined. You will be able to use properties of segments and angles to find their measures, and you'll be able to use the midpoint and distant formulas to solve problems. Let's start by looking at symbols we're going to be using for the rest of the year. You'll notice in the left-hand column, I have your vocabulary word. In the second column, I have the word symbol. That's going to show you what it looks like when we're writing it on paper or reading it on the homework. Um, the symbol in use is exactly what it's going to look like when you're reading word problems or you're trying to do your proofs or anything, you're gonna show me with the symbol in use column. And then I have a way to read it in the final column or how to say it. So this is the way I'm gonna say it in class. This is the way you're going to adopt in your reading and writing. And then I have two diagrams outside of the table just to make line segments and rays slightly clearer. So let's start by looking at the point. So you have the point in the vocabulary already. And now we see what its symbol is. It's literally a point, and then it's paired with the coordinate and symbol in use. So we have the point P, right? The point symbol, here's our coordinate, and we read that as the point P. Now we look at the line. We know a line continues forever in both directions. And then when we want to denote specific points on the line, since they're not going to be at the end of a line, considering there is no end, we just call it line AB, and that can look something like this. There's A, there's B. They're on the line, can't have them on the end because there is no end to this line, so we're going to say the line AB. We always denote lines with two points. It can be an end point, it could be a beginning point, or originating point is what I'll typically call it but it doesn't have to be, it just must be two collinear points or points that are on the same line. So then we're gonna look at our line segment. This is just a bar. There's no arrows on the end. This line has a definite or defined originating point and end point. So if we have just a bar over the top of two points, we're going to call that the line segment. And then what the two points are CD. So this one's slightly different. We are going to put the letters at the originating point and the end point. Just like here, I would read this as line segment AB, and that's exactly how I'll draw it in class. And all of the videos I make, um, if I'm explaining any of the homework, this is why I expect you guys to write. Next, we have the ray. Ray's kind of slightly different. It has the originating point of a line segment, and then it has the end of a line. So this ray has a clearly defined starting point that we're going to call E, but we don't put F on the end of this line because there is no end of the line in reality. So we just have two points there, E and F. It's a little easier to see here I would call this ray M N. So it has a defined originating point at M and somewhere along that never ending line heading off to the right, I have point N as well. All right. All right, so those are the types of lines that we'll be using in the class. Next, we have our angle measure and that's because we're going to jump right in with talking about how to measure angles or what the measurements of angles are depending on a bunch of different rules. So this M is read as the measure of, and this is the symbol for angle. So this is the measure of angle X. These bars here should be pretty familiar to everyone as absolute value bars. And what we're gonna discuss in just a few moments, the relationship between absolute value and length in a very basic way. So for the rest of the time that you're in math, 
you are going to most likely be hearing these bars referred to as the magnitude and the magnitude is synonymous or it means the same thing as the length so I would look at this and I know that this is the length of GH but I don't know if it's a line a line segment or array because that has not been denoted and that's pretty much what these next three cover for us I have an arrow on each end so this is the length of line AB this is the length of line segment CD because I don't have any arrows on the end so it's a truncation point followed by a truncation point and then I have the length of array which has an originating point at E and somewhere along the ray because it does extend forever we have the collinear point F capitalization matters in this course capital letters are for angles an angle is formed by two rays or two line segments with the same endpoint. A lowercase letter will denote a side. So if I write a little a and I ask for the magnitude of little a, you know that you are looking at a side length. If I ask for the measure of big A, then you know you are looking at an angle. Now on the previous slide, I did use capital letters and lowercase letters to denote points. That is fine. There is no standard method of denoting points. They are interchangeable. Capital P is different than lowercase p for points. But when you are talking about a specific side, we use lowercase letters and capitals for specific angles. Let's look at our first postulate. Remember, postulates are derived from inductive reasoning or reasoning that involves looking at a pattern and coming to an idea. So we have the ruler postulate. And the ruler postulate just says that any point can be associated with a number on a ruler. So if I ask you for the coordinate of A, I can see that A and negative three go together on my ruler. Here, our ruler is just the number line. A ruler is any device you can measure on. This is an infinitely long ruler that we are looking at a specific section of, and that section goes from negative three to four. The coordinate of B is zero. The coordinate of C is one, and the coordinate of D is four. So it's just saying that your point can be placed on any value on the ruler and we can go from there. Now we can start using the ruler postulate just like we do in real life to measure the distance between points and that's what we're actually getting ready to do. So let's look at our next slide. How would you find the length of CD? Well your first method would be simply to count it and since we're on a number line we can count starting at C and moving to D. That's one unit, two units, three units. So I get three units for the counting method. And think about this. Is the length of CD equivalent to the length of DC? Be prepared to defend your answer. So if I started at C and I go to D, I know I have a length of three. So then the question is, what if I do from here to here? That's one, two, three again. So then let's look at the length of line segment DC. And like we just showed, counting backwards, we have one, two, three. Now generally, going from right to left on a number line means we're looking at negative numbers. But we cannot have negative length. If anyone can provide me an example of actual negative length, I will give you a 100% on our first test, and you do not have to sit for the exam. So just provide me any example of negative length. And not only will I give you 100%, I will graciously offer first authorship on your paper as we tackle our PhD together. So like I brought purposeful attention to at the beginning when I introduced magnitude bars, they look a lot like our absolute value bars. 
and the reason we use absolute value bars and now we're going to call them magnitude bars are because length is always positive so if you pause the video and worked on negative length or thought about it welcome back um, unfortunately there's no real offer in that negative length 100% on the test or PhD that we could co-author um, sorry just keep in mind length is never negative so let's look at how we would find the length of CD mathematically well by the ruler postulate we can see that the value of C is 1 and the value of D is 4 and then it says to do this we need to calculate the difference of the position of the points difference is another word for subtract so we know we need to subtract or find the difference between 1 and 4 so to do that I'm going to do D minus C and that will give me the length of line segment CD so I'm going to use the ruler postulate to say that D and 4 are corresponding and C and 1 are corresponding so D minus C is equal to 4 minus 1 which gives me 3 and by the transitive property of equality if D minus C is equal to line segment CD and 4 minus 1 is equal to 3 and the value of D is 4 and the value of C is 1 then I can say that line segment CD is in fact equal to length 3. Now we've already discussed this but I want to reiterate if I had asked you this last week in class you would have told me those are absolute value bars. Magnitude is another word for length and length can never be negative so we use the absolute value bars to show that all right so let's put it all together can we show and this is kind of what this whole class is about here can we show that line segment cd is equal to line segment dc so i'm going to look at and this is putting everything we've talked about so far together point d minus point c so point d is four point C is 1 and I know that the difference between the two endpoints on a line segment will give me the length of that line segment so 4 minus 1 is equal to the absolute value of 3 or the magnitude of 3 which gives me line segment DC is equal to 3 now here I'm going to do it in the reverse because here I have line segment DC and here I have line segment CD I'm going to show in fact that they are equivalent so if DC equals 3 and CD equals 3 then we can say that D line segment DC is equal to line segment CD by the transitive property this statement where I have if something comma then something else is called a conditional statement that's coming later in the t topic but if X then Y statements are called conditional statements X is everything after if and before the comma right so DC equals 3 and CD equals 3 is my X value and then my Y value is everything after the comma through the end of the sentence does the order impact the length of a segment the order of the points no we've covered that a few times now that is always true all right so now we have the segment addition postulate and that's just saying if points A, B, and C are on the same line, which is another way of saying collinear, we can be more efficient now, with B, with, oh sorry, with B between A and C, then AB plus BC equals AC. So there's a few things you have to note here. If you want to be able to use the segment addition postulate, where's my pen? Notice that this line segment ends where this line segment begins and then we just have the new line segment being those combined that's pretty much what addition is but now we're just adding extra information so what we have here is a B plus BC and kind of visually there it's easy to see that those are in fact equivalent can I change colors yes okay so if I add these two together, if I start at A, 
and I travel oh, to B, and then I stop at B and I continue my travel down the line to C, my green line is equal to the sum of my two shorter red lines. This only works if the endpoint of your first line segment is the originating point of your second segment. And you can just take the two letters on the outside, create the, the initial originating point and the final endpoint of your line segment, and come up with a new line segment. You can also see that ABC is congruent to AC. And that's pretty easy to see on here as well. Now, this postulate tells us that line segments can be added together. This IFF, you'll see it a lot in this class, stands for if and only if. That means everything that you're about to see must be satisfied for this to work. If and only if the endpoint of one line segment is collinear, so they are on the same line, and the same point as the beginning of the next line segment. I know this definition is a little more confusing. As long as they're on the same line, and where one line segment stops, the next one begins, you can add them together with no problem. So let's try one together. I'm gonna go back to black. So it wants to know what is AB plus BD. First thing I'm going to do is check that I can even add these together. This endpoint is B and this starting point is B. So I have a pretty good feeling. Well, no, I don't have to have a feeling anymore. We now have the segment addition postulate. So we can say, because this one ends where this one begins, when we add them together, we're going to end up with a new line called AD. And to get its length, we can just add AB plus D. So what is my length of AB? Well, one, two, three. And what is my length of BD? Notice where I just stopped, I'm starting one, two, three, four. So now I know that the magnitude of line segment AD is equal to three plus four. So the length of line segment AD by the segment addition postulate is seven. Now, since I haven't actually shown you that to be true, this postulate, let's look and see if we're right. Well, there's a couple ways to do that. I can sit count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the count method works. Let's look at it this way. Let's find the length of DA. Well, D is four, and then A is negative three. So this will give me the length of DA, which is positive seven. So the calculating method works. I'm gonna call it the calc DA method. Now let's calculate it AD, and hopefully these three examples will be enough through what we'll learn to be inductive reasoning we're seeing a pattern emerge here that this is in fact length seven by the counting method and two separate calculation methods. Negative three for A minus four, but because this is a magnitude, we must take the absolute value. This yields an absolute value of negative seven, which also gives me seven so we have shown three different ways, well, two different ways, but three examples that this is in fact length seven. Three examples is the bare minimum for establishing a pattern through in inductive reasoning. So the question becomes, does using variables in place of constants impact the way the segment addition postulate works? Well, now that we're starting to get more complicated with our examples, Let's talk about a few of the most important rules in geometry. We're gonna learn a lot more about this in the upcoming subtopics for topic one, but whenever you do a problem like this, 
the first thing you always want to do is stop and look at the information that you're given. That is called your hypothesis. We'll learn more about that in a couple of classes from now. But you always want to start with your hypothesis because when we learn about truth tables, if you're not testing the hypothesis or what you're given, you're not productively approaching the problem. So let's look at what is on just this picture that we were given right here. We're given points F, G, and H are collinear. That means they're on the same line and that the value of GH is equal to 16. So that's not given on the line, but since it is expressed in the directions, I'm gonna go ahead and just write 16 there as an alternate value for um, GH. So, and then we, after we kind of look at what we're given, we need to determine what is it asking us to do? Well, it's asking us to find the length of line segment FH. So the first thing we can do is to solve for FH in terms of X. And to do that, we can look at it as the length of line segment FH is equal to the length of line segment FG plus the length of line segment GH. Well, is that true? FG has a terminating point that is also the originating point of GH. So the segment addition postulate will in fact work here. So let's see what that looks like. Well, I can make relevant substitutions. FG is 3x minus 1. And GH is 2x plus 2. Note, we're looking for this in terms of x. So if we simplify that, 3x plus 2x is 5x. And negative 1 plus 2 is positive 1. So just in plain terms of x, the length of line segment FH is 5x plus 1. Now we need to solve for x. And to do that, we can make this substitution. We started with here, and we're going to go right back to it. F of H, which we now know is equal to 5x plus 1, is equal to line segment, the length of line segment FG, which is 3x minus 1, plus the length of line segment GH, which is Sixteen, sorry. Plus the length of line segment GH, which is sixteen. We're going to use the alternate value here because we know that two x plus two is equal to sixteen, and that's a little hint to show you a shortcut next time. So we can start by combining like terms. Negative one plus sixteen yields fifteen, positive fifteen. So now we have 5x plus 1 is equal to 3x plus 15. I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides, and that gives me 14. And I'm going to take the 3x from both sides, and that gives me 2x equals 14, so x equals 7. I'm going to show you something right here. If we know the length of line segment gh is equal to 2x plus 2, and it's equal to 16, could have also just done this and arrived at the same answer. But because we're learning this, I wanted to show you the full thing and the shortcut. I'm fine with you guys doing this on the test, quiz, and homework that you will definitely be having on this. This will appear on the test, trust me. So now that we have the value of x, we can go back in here and it says, what is fh? Well, we have a bunch of ways we can do that as well. We know that FH is equal to 3X minus 1 plus 2X plus 2, where X equals 7. Remember, we got that back here. So if everywhere we see an X, we plug in 7. We get 21 minus 1 plus 14 plus 2, and that does come out to 36. Again, that is the long way around, but that does show the segment addition postulate in its entirety. What we can do for a shortcut is we know that the length of line segment FH is equal to 5 times X plus 1 and if X is 7 I could just say that, right? I took 5X plus 1 
where x equals 7. So 5 times 7 plus 1, and that's equal to the length of line segment FH. So now I have checked two different ways, and I've gotten 36 both times. So I can confidently say that yes, we can use variables to solve the segment addition postulate. And we can also feel pretty confident in our answer of 36. All right, let's talk about our second postulate that we're going to learn. This is the protractor postulate. It's very similar to the segment addition postulate, but instead of using segments and adding them together, we're going to be looking at angles and adding them together. It's called the protractor postulate because we use the protractor to measure angles. But before we really get into that, and my things to note here, I have line segment AD is a straight angle. And the measure of any angle that is a straight line will always be 180 degrees. Look at anything around you, and if it is a sh perfectly straight line, the top of your monitor, the side of your desk, the side of your computer, anything that is a straight line has a 180 degree angle measure. And that's really important coming up for a lot of our proofs. So just put that in your notes, highlight that in your notes, a straight line measures 180 degrees. Uh, and the reason we need to know that information is similar to our segment addition postulate. If I know from here all the way to here in red is 180 degrees, and I'm giving something like the measure of angle A, B, C is equal to 60 degrees. And I'm asked to find the measure of angle D, B, C. But it's not overlaid on a protractor like this. Then I can use the protractor postulate. So let's say, let me highlight these. This is D, B, C. And then in green, I need to mark A, B, C. So the way I've color coded this and according to the protractor postulate, just visually, my green section plus my blue section is equal to my red section. And I know my red section already is 180 degrees. And I know my green section is 60 degrees. I don't know what my blue section is. So I can do some simple math really quick to see that it's 120 degrees. Or as we have here, what is 180? Because that's the straight angle minus 60 degrees. Well, that leaves me with 120 degrees. Now, before we move on, we have to talk about something. When we read or talk about angles, the vertex is always the middle letter when writing angles the vertex is always the middle letter so let's look at this one our green letter a b c I said was 60 degrees, so I'm going to switch back to green. So ABC, we start at A, then we travel to B, and then we go to C. Notice that B is in the middle. So this whole section is angle ABC, and we're finding the measure where the two rays meet. At the same time, we are finding that my D B C fills out this area. And we can kind of see now that my green side plus my blue side gives me my red 180. Right? Everything is now colored in. So green plus blue is equal to 180. Keep that in mind for everything in this class. This is one of the biggest things, knowing that a straight line is 180 degrees. 
everything we need in the rest of this topic requires that topic two is very reliant on that information and let's do one together really quick so here I have M in the middle so I know that has to be my vertex so that means I'm going to start at J travel to M and then travel to L so J M L is 80 degrees I'm going to change color because color coding makes this much easier to see. Now we have K, so I'm going to start at K, travel to M, and then travel to L. So from K to M to L is this angle inside of here, and that is 33 degrees. And it wants to know what is the measure of angle J, M, K. Well, J, M, K we'll do in green since we haven't used it yet. We can do that like we did with the other one. Start at J, go to M, go to K, and it wants to know what is that. So I'm going to use it as X. So to determine this, I'm going to look at my overall angles. My reds disappeared at some point. So the big angle, J, M, L, is 80 degrees. And I want to know what X is, so I'm going to put that on the equal side. And I know that of my total 80 degrees, I've subtracted out 33, right? Because the opposite of, if I add these together, I'll get 80. So if I subtract 33 from 80, I'll get what's left. So 80 minus 33 is 47. So X is 47 degrees. Now, when you have a ray that cuts through a larger angle, so JML is cut by ray MK, the resulting angle, so my green and my purple are called adjacent angles. Adjacent angles will always add up to the larger angle that they're inside. So let's look at it here. I get the same thing, different colors, but JML is in blue for 80. KML is in green for 33, which are our givens, and it's asking us to find what is X. Well, 80 minus 33, right? The large angle is 80 minus the small angle in green, 33. Whatever's left must be the value of our unknown. Can we test that? Well, yeah. We also know that purple plus green must equal 80. So does 47 plus 33 equal 80? Yes, 80 equals 80. So now we can do it again with variables. Everything we do in this class for a while is going to be showing you with constants, and then we're going to ask, can we do it with variables? Well, let's think about it. Yes, we definitely can. And I believe I have, oh, nope. Let's do it together instead, and then we'll double check that we got the same answer. So I know that D, B, A, or we can also call it D, A is equal to 180 degrees because it's a straight angle, right? It's a straight line, well, straight ray from A to D is 180 degrees. Now I know that D, B, C is equal to 7Y and C, B, A is equal to 5Y. So these are my adjacent angles. And that's because they share line segment BC and they're both on the interior or the same side of D, A. So I can say that if D, A is 180 degrees, and 7y is part of it, and 5y is the other part. That 5y plus 7y is equal to 180. That's our algebraic way to show it. Our geometric way to show it is d, b, c. It's angle d, b, c plus angle c, b, a is equal to d, a 
And again, we have DC, CB, so kind of like our segment addition postulate, we now have our originating point to our end point being our result. So 5y plus 7y is 12y, which is 180, or it's equal to 180. Divide both by 12, and we get y equals 15. Because you can want to see how I did it in my head. 6 times 2 is equal to 12. 180 divided by 6 is 30 divided by 2 is 15. So we can say y is equal to 15. Oops, my little guy up. And then if we want to get the actual measures of these angles, we can plug in 15 for y both times. So we would have B, B, C is equal to 7 times 15 and C, B, A is equal to 5 times 15. Oh, 4 times 15 is 60 plus one more 15 is 75. So this would be 105 and that gives me 180. Go ahead and verify that, but it should work out. Let's see what we got. 75 and 105. So now we're going to learn about what I'm going to call tick marks. And these tick marks mean if they have the same number associated with each line segment, then they're equal in length. So line segment AB is congruent. That's what this symbol is read as. And we're going to use that more than we use equals in this class. I haven't been doing it yet because we haven't um, gotten to it. That is a combination of two signs. That is your equal sign on the bottom with your similar sign on top. We're going to learn similarity much later in the year. But I can tell you that this symbol means they are both similar and equal. Similar is a geometric term for proportionally the same. And the equal is a numerical equivalency. So when you put these together, that means that the geometric shape or this line segment is the same length as the other line segment. So we can say that AB and CD are the same length or they're congruent. Now, CD and PQ are not the same length by these marks. One tick mark to one tick mark means the same. Two to two means the same. So we can say line segment PQ is congruent to RS. Now, this is the first time I'm going to say this in this class. It is not the last, and you will be extremely tired of hearing this. But you cannot trust your eyes. If I come up here, and I put a second tick mark here, now CD is also congruent to these two. These tick marks, especially in geometry, override everything. You cannot trust your senses here. None of us are machines. None of us can draw everything to be precise so that they are the same length. We must use these tick marks to denote when something is congruent. So right now, as it appears on the screen, CD, PQ, and RS are all the same length. AB, line segment AB, stands alone in its own length as of right now. AB and CD appear to be the same length. We cannot trust our eyes. These tick marks are the end all, be all, on length for things that we draw in this course. Write that down in your notes. Do not forget it. And I will tell you more times than you'll ever want to hear for the rest of this year, you cannot trust your eyes. And this is why. I am going to draw this line, this line, and this line. I attempted to draw three lines that were the same length. My first line and my third line look pretty close. My second line doesn't. But I can tell you that all three of these lines have a length of five. That was my intention. Obviously, I didn't draw them that way. So I'm going to put my tick marks on it. And now they are all the same length. This goes exactly the same 
for the angles. If I were to tell you that angle TUV is 60 degrees, then XYZ is 60 degrees. If I were to tell you this is 115 degrees, by the tick marks, these are both now 115 degrees. We don't stop at two, we can have three, four, five, six, seven, eight tick marks. We'll talk about regular polygons, we'll go into hexagons, octagons, and we'll need more and more tick marks to show congruency or non-congruency. All right, I have no doubt that you have seen the midpoint and distance formula all throughout Algebra 1, so we're not going to get too far into their base use, but we are going to discuss um, a percentage or a fraction of the distance along the distance of a line, or the length of a line, sorry. Um, let's put that into kind of a real-world example. If you are sitting in my classroom right now, if you walk out of my classroom and turn left, which we can't do right now because we only turn right out of my classroom, but in a non-COVID world where we don't have directional arrows, if you were to turn left out of my classroom, let's say Dr. Clifford's room is 100 feet from my door to get to his door. So you travel 100 feet to get to his room. And I tell you that Mr. Joensen's room is 60% or six tenths or three fifths of the distance from my door to Dr. Clifford's door, how far do you have to travel? Well, you would, in this example, take 100 feet, that's the total distance, and we know he's at 60% of the distance for Johansson's room. We would do 100 times 0.6, and we could say that Mr. Johansson's door is therefore 60 feet from my door. We are going to be doing that though on a coordinate plane and we're not going to always get nice easy numbers like 60 percent of 100. So let's look at partition of a segment. That just means if I have the line segment AB I need to find its total length and then I just need to know what is the coordinate that's three-fifths of the way from A to B. So I'm going to find the total length that I would have to travel to go from point A to B and then I'm going to go back and say, well, what if I only wanted to go 60%? And I will be able to find exactly where that point is on this graph. And you can't just say, here's half, so we'll go a little bit more, and it's like right here. We have to actually mathematically show it. All right, so let's look at what a partition of a segment actually is. So what we're going to do is find three-fifths of the way from A to B. So if my classroom door is A and Dr. Clifford's is B, then we need to find where is Mr. Johansson's, who is three-fifths of the way. Great coincidence that I chose 60% and then the problem that I had coming up was 60%. Extremely lucky on that one. So starting at my room, I need to know how much does my X value change and how much does my Y value change. The change in X and the change in Y. This triangle just means the change. There's nothing more complicated than that. It's just another symbol that we'll use every so often. So the change in my x coordinates and what's the change in my y coordinates. So my ax, right, the x coordinate of my a is 3. And to find the change or the difference, I'm going to do ax minus bx, which is 13. And of course, these are links, right? Because we're traveling that distance. So I'm going to get, I would get negative 10, but I'm going to also just go ahead and resolve the absolute value there. So 3 minus 13 is negative 10, and the absolute value of negative 10 is positive 10. Now I'm going to look at my, a court, my point A y value minus my point B y value. So if I go to A, my Y value is negative 4 minus my B, point B, Y value is 11. Again, these are links. So negative 4 minus 11 is negative 15, but I'm going to take the absolute value of that, and I have 15. So my change in X is 10, and my change in Y is 15. 
algebraically, the way I wrote that might be the most confusing, but we are going to have to start writing in generalized forms for all of our problems because we're going to be doing a lot of proofs. So I'm going to start off strong with doing this. And luckily we're recording this video so we can watch it again and again until what does A subscript X mean? Well, looking at point A, that's my X value, minus looking at point B, my X value. That's when I get used to that. This triangle just means the change in. And since I put triangle X, this means the change in X, the change in Y. So that's how much they've changed. That doesn't tell us anything other than that's how far it is, or that's how our X values change walking from my classroom door to Dr. Clifford's classroom door. So now we need to figure out well, what does that mean to us? Well, that's the full distance. But we need to know what is three fifths of the change in X and what is three fifths in the change of Y because that'll tell us how far we have to actually travel to get to Mr. Johansson's door. So here, if I use the distributive property, I would get 30 over 5, and 30 divided by 5 is 6. And here, I would get 3 times 15, which is 45 divided by 5, which is 9. And of course, because we're doing distributive property, we have to do these as well. So I can just say 6 is 3 fifths of the change in X and 9 is 3 fifths of the change in Y. Now, what's going to end up happening here is, well first let's put that as an ordered pair. This is the change in X and the change in Y. But that's not our final position. That's not how far we're traveling, right? That is not how far along the line we would end up. And we can kind of make sense of that by looking at here. This looks like we end up at six, nine. So this is four, six, eight. So six, nine is somewhere like right here. So there's one or two problems here. We either found this incorrectly or we're not quite finished yet. We're not quite finished yet. All this is telling us is the change in X and the change in Y. But we have to go back to our initial value, which is three, negative four and apply our change in x and our change in y so what we really get for our final plates or how far what is the coordinate for mr johansson's door we get three plus six and negative four plus nine which gives us nine comma five so we go to the coordinate nine five and this is where Mr. Johansson's door would be. All right, let's do a potential homework problem here. So we have find the coordinates of the point seven tenths of the way from A to B. So we have point A, which is at negative three, negative seven. We have point B, which is at 10, Four, and we need to find seven tenths of the way. Now, here's why I have writing assignments every quarter. Here's why I want you to really start merging your English language skills and everything with your mathematical ability. That's because reading is such a vital part of this course, especially on the test and EOC. So it says seven tenths of the way from A to B. That means starting at A and traveling towards B. So when I find my change in X and Y, I need to add them to A, not B. We could go from B to A, and that would be a slightly different problem, and it would definitely land us in a different spot. But we need 7 tenths of the way from A to B. So the first thing I need to do is find my change in X, and that's just simply negative 3 minus 10 and we take the absolute value of that, which gives me 13. And then I need my change in y, which is the absolute value of negative 7 minus 4. And that gives me positive 11. 
Now I need 7 tenths of each of these numbers. And I'll be 100% honest with you, looking at them, I'm not very happy with them. I don't think they're going to be whole numbers. And the directions don't say round, so we may have a problem here. But let's push through and find out. So we're going to do 7 tenths of 13 and 7 tenths of 11. This is going to give me 7.7 .7 and 13 times 7 is 91, so 9.1. Now I have to add, the, that's just my change in my x and my change in my y at 70%. So now I have to go back and add them to my a. So I'm going to take 9.1, add it to negative 3. That's going to give me 6.1. And then I'm going to take 7.7 .7 and add it to my negative 7. And that's going to give me 0.7. As I sit here looking at this, I feel even less confident now that this is going to be the right answer. But let's see, 6.1. comma 0.7 well all right so welcome to you know homework number one on Savas they will do that to you um, where's my smooth draw so 6.1 and 0.7 so yes I know I said I was worried that I wasn't right I know I said I was worried that it was looking worse and worse but we're gonna push on it's all just you know a dramatic setup to say Everything in this course is going to be you knowing what you're doing, knowing that your algebra skills are strong enough to be here today, and just understanding that if you're given a theorem, or especially if you're given a theorem, it's always going to work. Now, this is not a theorem. This is not even a postulate. This is just a partition of a segment. And that's going to have a lot of value later on in chapter 10 when we start doing arc links and sections of arcs and sectors of circles and segments of circles. So I just want you to get comfortable with this now. But no matter how crazy the answer is, I chose this problem just to illustrate where, you know, high school geometry says your last math EOC course, be ready for anything and don't doubt yourselves. If you're enrolled in one of my courses and you're watching this at school or at home, go ahead and start working on your homework. Contact me in any way that you would like and to get help. If you're just watching this on YouTube because you're looking for a little extra help, leave a comment and I'll respond to it.